everyone. Thanks, Linda, for inviting me to present at this conference. I'm more used to uh, presenting in person, but I'm happy to share some thoughts with you over this recorded lecture in these new times. Of course, some of the positive things that have come out of this awful pandemic are cleaner air. If you go to cities around the world which were polluted and people couldn't breathe, now you're seeing clear skies, uh, seeing distant mountains, more wildlife, birds. That's a fantastic outcome. However, this pandemic will be over, then what will happen? Are we back to what we were doing before, burning fossil fuels and creating more pollution? Well, it doesn't have to be that way. We have extensive renewable energy uptake already around the world. We have wind farms, we have solar farms, there's wave energy. There are different forms of renewable energy that are being implemented all over the world. And Australia has a very large uptake of both wind and solar, which is great, it's fantastic. The only problem with that is that you need to be able to have energy storage or efficient energy storage because the renewable energy, energy um, technologies that we have available tend to be, or are, uh, in fact, uh, intermittent or variable. They're not, not a constant supply. So that means the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow, um, you've got different seasons, um, different, different day and night. And so you can't get that constant supply of energy when you need it. And so you need to have energy storage and that's well accepted now. There are multiple energy storage options. Um, today I'm gonna to talk mostly about electrochemical energy storage. But if you look at this particular um, example here, you can see that there is pumped hydro, which makes up a, a large fraction of our stored energy that will support our grid here in Australia and other parts of the world, in fact. This is because in pumped hydro, you can store gigawatt hours of energy quite easily, quite readily for backing up the grid. The problem with pumped hydro is you don't always have um, the geology or geography available that you need to be able to set up a pumped hydro station. Also, if you're looking at distributed energy uh, supply or, or behind, the, behind the meter supply, pumped hydro doesn't really cut it. So the other energy storage technology that's been deployed extensively is lithium ion. Uh, and that's primarily because lithium ion has been on the market now since 1992, when Sony first released its first battery. Um, people are making millions, if not billions, of these devices um, their cells uh, pretty much all over Asia and China and also in America with the um, Tesla giga gigafactories. And so we have, we know the technology readily available. It's what people um, can buy and, 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 uh, store and, and use as storage at the moment. But it's not the only possibility. Even within this, this graph here, you can see there's, there's a sodium battery, lead acid, flow batteries, um, one could use compressed air, for example, ultra capacitors, thermal storage. There's lots of different types of storage and it depends on what you're trying to use it for. And we mustn't forget also chemical energy storage is really important in this mix. And my colleague, Professor Doug McFarlane, will be talking more about that in this, in this conference series. So this is some examples of um, the battery installations here in Australia since 2017. We had that awful um, blackout in South Australia that caused a uh, uh, a, a huge um, problem here for Australia in terms of renewable energy uh, implementation because of that failure was blamed on renewable energy, even though it wasn't necessarily the cause. Um, but the outcome from that failure, that problem, was that we uh, saw a lot more um, interest in, in using uh, energy storage for backing up renewable energy for the grid. And so in South Australia, we have the Tesla batteries, it was called, um, 129 megawatt hour, uh, battery based on lithium NMC cells. Um, there are now other installations around Australia, um, uh, Victoria, South Australia, um, Northern Territory, um, WA, looking at uh, lithium, again, mostly lithium metal, lithium iron, sorry, installations for, for grid storage. Um, but it's not just grid storage we have to consider. It's also transportation, for example. We have other applications where energy storage is important. And transportation probably is the next biggest thing for us to consider, like electric vehicles, electrification of our public transport, buses, um, other metros, uh, moving away from fossil fuel or diesel. Also in terms of uh, unmanned vehicles, um, whether they be drones, whether they be uh, satellites or low, low, low level satellites, uh, small aircraft. So these applications require different, potentially different sorts of chemistries. And so, um, Lithium ion may not be the only chemistry we need to consider, and, and grid storage is not the only application we should be considering either in our, in our um, chase for new energy storage, clean energy storage, or clean energy um, technologies. I keep talking about chemistry, battery chemistry, so I want to show you a schematic of a typical lithium ion battery here. 
Um, there are, it's full of different components of the materials components. You have the anode and the cathode. You have um, the electrolyte in the middle, which, which transports ions from one electrode to the other electrode. You have the separator in this case, because the electrolytes are liquid and you have to physically separate the two electrodes, you don't want them shorting. So um, these materials currently are primarily uh, porous uh, polymer, polyolefin-based separators. Um, the electrolyte itself is what we, my group works mostly on, and that currently um, is, is a volatile organic electrolyte which causes problems with respect to safety. Uh, it also causes problems with respect to enabling other electrode chemistries um, to, be, to be used, which we'll talk about a bit later on. Even with this lithium-ion battery configuration, um, you have different chemistries. You have, for the anode in this case, you've got a graphite, where lithium-ion can translate in and out of the graphite. You could replace that with silicon or silicon graphite composites, or indeed lithium metal anodes, which is one of the holy grails that we can talk a bit about uh, later. On the cathode side, you have here lithium-ion phosphate, which is a safer cathode compared to some of the other cathodes, but it's lower voltage, lower capacity, so um, doesn't have quite the, the, the draw card, if you like, of the higher capacity cathodes for some applications, but it is safer. So it may be good for grid applications, for example. But the cathodes that people are looking at now developing for electric vehicles in particular are based around nickel manganese cobalt NMC or nickel cobalt aluminium NCA. Uh, these are higher voltage, higher capacity cathode materials. But they come with problems because the more energy you pack into one of these batteries, the more chance of it um, are having blowing up or catching fire. Um, and so we've, we've seen that over the years uh, in numerous instances, from computers to mobile phones to Tesla cars to uh, batteries in the home. So there are stringent conditions in place and certainly all over the world uh, standards to ensure that uh, we do look at safety standards. You can improve the safety by, by the way you package it, the way you control the battery system. Um, but intrinsically, the, the materials in that battery, uh, at the moment anyway, um, are not particularly safe. But as one of my colleagues said, if there is gasoline in a vehicle, uh, it tends to explode too if, uh, uh, if you have an accident catches fire. So we have to be aware that we have a lot of energy we're storing in these batteries. It's not just about safety with respect to, to the, the battery itself and, and, and loss of property uh, and maybe life. It's also the impact of some of these technologies on the environment. And the impact may be also socially of some of these technologies. And so this is a, a graph that came out of a report written for, uh, prepared by um, the a Sydney group, uh, UTS, um, for the Australian Council of Learning Academies, for a report that was presented to the Chief Scientists of Australia a few years ago. Um, and in this report, um, we looked at uh, the impact of different technologies in different areas, whether it be um, the life cycle, the supply criticality chain, the chain, um, material intensity, recyclability, also human rights, health and safety. And so red dots mean not so good. Um, yellow dots mean uh, very good and orange is somewhere in between, obviously. If we look at the lithium ion and NMC column, you see that there are quite a few red dots. The supply chain criticality is quite important because lithium um, comes in two forms primarily. One is, uh, as we find in Bolivia, Argentina and Chile, for example, in South America, in the form of um, these salt flats. Uh, and then you have to consider what the impact of the environment is as we mine this as well. And in the other case in Australia and China and some other countries, we have spodumene, uh, which we can mine and then uh, use chemistry to extract the lithium out of that to prepare um, lithium salts and, and, lithium, and lithium cathodes. So the problem is it's not distributed evenly. And so you potentially down the track may have some issues in terms of supply. You also have the same problem with cobalt, which is um, primarily uh, mined in, in Africa. Uh, and there, what we have also a situation of human rights conditions um, and the, the environmental and the social impact uh, of that mining um, has come under scrutiny uh, in, in over the years. So NMC is not necessarily a technology we should be using for everything because it does come with several critical criticalities. Lithium ion phosphate is better. And if you look at sodium ion, which we'll talk about later, again, you see a lot more yellows there. So, and flow batteries also. So there are other options. Um, we have to consider safety, we have to consider criticality, supply to consider environmental and social impact as well. So beyond lithium ion batteries then, so if we're not going to use lithium ion batteries that we've talked about, NMC we've talked about, for example, what, what's available? So here, looking at the periodic table, we have multiple options here. Uh, on the anode side, we could look at sodium, potassium, magnesium, we have aluminium, we have silicon. On the cathode side, we can use oxygen, we use air, and we talk about metal air batteries, uh, and sulfur, we'll talk about that as well. 
Um, and some of these are, are cheaper, they're, they're environmentally less impact or um, and friendlier than the existing technologies, which is great. So in terms of what's already out there, um, sodium iron actually probably is, is quite is relatively advanced. There are about three, at least three companies I'm aware of, one in, one in England, one in France, and one in China, that uh, startups that are now making and in some cases for adding selling um, sodium iron batteries to the market. In fact, recently there was a, a report of Ferradian joining with an Australian uh, company looking at uh, importing sodium iron batteries into, into the Australian market, which is, which is, which is great to have that option. Um, there's lithium metal anode based batteries. In this particular case, the Bolloro Group uh, from Technology from Hydro Quebec in Canada uh, are making are using lithium metal polymer batteries, solid state batteries, for applications in small vehicles, uh, but also in applications where areas where safety is paramount and where the temperatures are higher than, than average. So in Africa, for example, we have in the desert, we have high temperatures. Lithium ion doesn't cut it. You have to look at other technologies. Lithium sulfur, uh, as we've been saying, uh, why lithium sulfur? Sulfur has a much higher capacity. So you can maybe, in, in theory, drive your car for longer, for example, or have run your mobile phone for longer. Um, there are some companies beginning to look at these commercially. Metal air at the moment is a primary cell, which means you can't recharge it um, electrochemically. You either have to mechanically recharge it or throw it away. Um, and then flow cells, which we'll talk briefly about. There's two that I'm aware of. Uh, commercially, the Vanadium Flow Cell, Red T is a company in Australia that, um, that, that is selling to Australia, and one of, and Red Flow uh, Australia um, uh, markets is in bromide flow battery um, as well. Just some examples of what's out there already. So let's look at some of the chemistries then, uh, upcoming chemistries that we, we've talked about. Sodium batteries is an area that my team works in quite extensively, um, together with uh, Professor McFarlane's team uh, at Monash. Um, why sodium? Uh, in fact, sodium was looked at before lithium back in the 70s and 80s. And when I first did my postdoc uh, in America, we were looking at sodium electrolytes, sodium polymer electrolytes, in fact. Um, but in 1992, when Sony uh, released the lithium ion battery, everyone went to lithium ion. And it was just sodium, just a, um, a, a curiosity, if you like. And so for a long time, uh, not much was done in that, in that area. Um, but sodium batteries offer, offer advantages that lithium does not have in terms of um, it's abundant. Sodium is abundant everywhere. You know, salt is, you know, contains sodium, so it's very, very abundant. So, which means um, you haven't got the geographical issues and you've got potentially cheaper uh, resources. Um, you um, also don't have to use copper as one of the current collectors in your cell. You can use aluminium on both, which means weight wise and cost wise, that brings down the cost and the weight and increases your potential for energy, uh, potentially the energy density for the battery. Um, it's also safer because you're using aluminium on both sides. It's actually also safer. You can, you can actually um, uh, ship by air sodium batteries in a charged state, which you cannot currently do for lithium ion. There are some challenges. People thought sodium and lithium just be dropping technology. There are some challenges because um, sodium is bigger than lithium. The speciation, the chemistry around sodium is a bit different. Uh, as a result, it's not just a dropping technology. The, the manufacturing um, equipment could be very similar, if not the same, but it's not. It does require some change of the materials that we use. You can't use graphite because sodium is too big, it goes in, exfoliates the graphite. But you can use hard carbons, and those hard carbons can come from bi burning biomass. So it becomes another renewable um, source, if you like, for that material rather than mining graphite. Um, there are still issues in terms of optimizing the electrolyte to get the maximum transport for sodium, still issues around optimizing the electrode electrolyte interfaces, and still issues around getting uh, the high capacity. Um, cathodes to work. So lots of research going on still, but I, I think watch this space. I think sodium ion batteries are going to be, sodium batteries are going to be one of the um, contenders in replacing lithium for some applications, not for all applications when you're putting high energy density, for some applications. Lithium sulfur is, is one that another holy grail because lithium sulfur potentially has really high energy density, which means you can drive the car for much longer than I said before and, and, um, and uh, also run a device much longer. And that's because sulfur has a really high capacity. There's a lot of electrons in, in, in the, a lot of different reactions for sulfur uh, reduction, which means you've got more electrons, which means high capacity. There are problems. Sulfur is not conductive, so you have to mix it with a conductive source like carbon or some other, other network which provides the electron transport. Um, there are problems because the, um, the sulfur expansion and contraction of that cathode can, can destroy um, the actual mechanical, destroy the cathode. So you have to think of clever ways to to fix that, and people are doing that uh, all, over the, all over the world, including here in Australia. Um, there are problems with the sulfur dissolving as polysulfides in the electrolyte and then 
shuffling across over to the, to the electrode, which is lithium metal, um, and then that is degraded and corroded and therefore you lose um, the, the battery performance. And there's still the problem of how do we get the lithium metal to actually work for properly for long enough. That's something which is ongoing research, including in our laboratories. How do you change? Uh, how do you use um, various uh, protective barriers? How do you use particular additives to improve that lithium uh, metal surface um, performance? Metal air batteries uh, are also really important uh, and becoming more and more to the fore because um, in this case, you don't have to carry one of your active materials is oxygen from the air. So you're not carrying that with you in theory. Um, primary metal air batteries have been known for a long, long time. Zinc air is what has been and still being used for uh, hearing aids, um, but they're one-off use. You use them, they, they, they discharge and they go flat and then that's it. You have to throw them away and, and replace them. What, ideally what you want is to be able to charge and recharge it multiple times. Uh, and that requires a lot of research still, and that's still what's ongoing at the moment. One is how do you control that metal again, whether it's zinc, whether it's magnesium, whether it's sodium, whether it's lithium, whether it's aluminium, how do you control the cycling of that metal char charge and discharge to avoid dead dry growth, to avoid passivation, to avoid what's called dead metal, dead lithium, dead sodium. That's um, a lot of work going towards stabilizing the metal. A lot of work also going into stabilizing the cathode because the air cathode has to breathe, allow oxygen to get in and out, and other water to, to leave. Um, oxygen getting more to leave. But in, in the reaction process, you end up forming uh, a solid state um, product. And that product has to be reversibly uh, dissolved again in order. So you precipitate it during the, the, the charge, and then you want to sort of discharge and you have to dissolve it again during the charge. And um, that's quite challenging and a lot of research going on to how to properly control that, that, that product that forms and also to clog up the, the, um, the, the cathode, which has to allow air to come in and out. So a lot of research going on, on here, including uh, in my team um, at Deakin, um, especially around the electrolytes to try and stabilise both anode and cathode in this case. But again, if we can get this to work, you're almost getting energy densities of, of even more than gasoline uh, in some cases, well, this is a fuel cell here, the hydrogen air, but close to gasoline, lithium air, and sodium air is in there, but it's also close to, close to lithium air. So it's a lot of potential, a lot of research going into trying to optimise all these materials for this particular device to become feasible. Then um, the redox flow battery is the uh, next uh, one I want to just talk about briefly. Um, this is not one that we work on extensively in my, in my group. Um, however, it's really important. This vanadium, vanadium redox seer was designed, developed probably more than 20 years ago by an Australian scientist, Maurice Scholz Kazakis in UNSW, uh, and then didn't go very far, I guess, because there wasn't a demand for electric chemical energy storage. People were still burning fossil fuels happily um, or gas. And so, but now there's a resurgence of, of interest in that area, both from the point of the materials technology and the systems technologies to improve um, this redox flow battery. The beauty of this device is that. Um, you, can, you can discharge it with 100% of depth of discharge completely and you can then uh, recharge it quite simply. It doesn't destroy the material because you just have to top up the tanks. Um, chemical tanks that hold the solutions, aqueous solutions that are flowing around the electrodes. Um, the uh, problems with these potentially is at the moment vanadium is, is the main component. There are other uh, chemistries being looked at um, and there is a potential for toxicity to consider there. Also, there is a potential, there is a problem with the uh, membrane, which um, allows crossover of ions from one tank to the other tank, or undesirable crossover, I should say. And that means the efficiency is not as good. And so there are issues about how we improve that. Um, however, uh, these are technologies which are already being implemented. For example, Monash University is having one of these, one megawatt hour, one of these put um, on its premises uh, to, to support um, its, its uh, electricity supply for the university campus. So other types of metal ion batteries, without going into details, um, I've mentioned potassium and aluminium and magnesium before, but these are ongoing research, um, R&D, I guess, but more on the research level. Potassium, even uh, more than sodium potentially, can be dropped into lithium ion technology. You can use graphite, you get high theoretical capacity for potassium anodes. The problem there still is developing the cathode materials for potassium uh, ion batteries. Um, the electrolyte materials can be modeled to some extent on, on lithium and sodium ones, but that's ongoing work. Uh, aluminium iron, uh, it would be fantastic because you've got three electrons per aluminium, so really high, uh, potentially high capacity. 
Um, but you have issues with uh, electrolytes again. The ones currently that are um, available are highly acidic, highly corrosive, and um, that's the only way to get the aluminium reversible. So we have to work on, on those systems if you want to make them more uh, extensive. And magnesium iron has, again, lack of electrolyte suitability to get the magnesium um, reversible. And also in this case, at the moment, anyway, lack of a suitable high intensity cathode material. So that's all work going on all over the world to look at different chemistries. Um, I'm sure as we move forward, we'll see a lot more uh, of these chemistries available. Very quickly, I wanna talk about, um, or just show you that we've got, as well as doing the chemistry, you have to be able to prototype your materials to show they actually work in real cells. So we have a facility called Battery Hub down in Geelong. Uh, we were able to take materials made by ourselves and others, and put them into real pouch cells, up to one, more than one amp hour cells, um, to demonstrate that the materials um, can work and do work and, and, and start to look at upscaling these, these devices for, for um, uh, high-end applications. I won't go into details about what's on, on here. I'm sure you can look at the slide yourself if you're interested. And then before I finish, I want to talk about something I think is really, really important and dear to my heart, and that is we mustn't replace the current problem of greenhouse gas emissions and climate change with pollution due to disposal of batteries, disposal of electrical waste, and particularly here of batteries. If we all have an electric vehicle and in five years' time we are um, putting, replacing the battery, where does that battery go? Into, into landfill. So we have to think about now, about stewardship, about um, battery recycling, and, and there are companies already doing that around the world, also in Australia. Um, still an issue, but we are working on that. Eco-designing the next generation of batteries, so we haven't got this problem. We can, we can recycle it more easily. Um, new materials, new processes. It's really, really important that we look at this very seriously before it becomes a problem, before we have the climate change or greenhouse gas problem that we have at the moment. Um, and again, this is the circular economy design. You uh, repurpose, recycle, redesign, rather than the linear design which we currently have, which is mine it, make it, use it, throw it away into landfill. So with that, I want to thank um, my group. Uh, this is just some of my group uh, at, at Deakin uh, University, my collaborators, um, at, both in Europe, in Spain, Polymat, and Siasa and Jigune, and at Monash University, uh, and my team. And I want to thank um, uh, all Deakin and Monash research teams and all the, the, the funding agencies for helping us do the research that we do. And thank you.